screen is done. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 o'clock. Item 1, invocation, pledge, Mr. Skeeter Hubert. Thank you. Feel free to join me if you desire to, in, in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are certainly grateful for this day. We are grateful for this school year and for all those hands that are involved from the protection from the police to the teacher in the classroom. We are grateful for all of their work and their effort and their, their dedication to serve this community and, and be there for these youth and for our community. We are grateful for the weather, for the rain we have received and our protection in it. We invite thy spirit to be upon us this day that, that we will have it upon us as we discuss the matters of Conroe ISD. We pray for all those that are here and all those on their way or those that can't make it this day. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. <laughs> I'm honored to Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. All right, item two, A, citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey? Yes, we have six people signed up to speak. The next item on the agenda is public comment for those who have registered to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please keep in mind that this portion of the meeting is not the appropriate form for bringing complaints for which resolution is sought. Complaints must be addressed by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures before they can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item. The board has an obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that personally identifies a student. Therefore, unless you are talking about your own child or you are over the age of 18 years of um, uh, over the age of 18 years speaking about yourself the board cannot permit comments that include students names or any information that might identify a specific student if an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's posted agenda the board will defer its discussion of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda for any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Those who have registered for the board, those who have registered to address the board will be limited to no more than five minutes for their presentation. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person. Thank you. Nicole May. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Knoll. I'm here tonight again to talk about dyslexia and dyslexia services within our district. October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. What better way to honor our dyslexic students in CISD than to, dis than to discuss with all of you the health and well being of our dyslexia department? I will start by stating I am pro teacher, pro campus, and pro district. Tonight, I would like to discuss two important subjects. The first subject I will title, The Stakes Are High. The second subject I will title, Compliance Versus Commitment. Just a quick review, I am a stakeholder. I have two dyslexic sons. The oldest is 13 and has completed basic language skills. The youngest is eight and is currently working through the dyslexia program. Both sons are required, are required private tutoring on top of district services and accommodations in order to be successful students. We will have spent upwards 40,000 total for both boys by the end, by the time it's all said and done. As I speak tonight, please contemplate heavily the families that do not have the extra money or time. First subject, the stakes are high. It is widely accepted that one in five people are dyslexic. 20% of our, dys of our student population struggles to read and decode words that non-dyslexic peers oftentimes easily and quickly learn to do. That is approximately 12,925 students within our district that are dyslexic. 
Early identif identification is key to preventing the gap from widening to the point that prevents the dyslexic student from thriving and succeeding in school. Dr. Meredith Whedon, CEO of Nyhaus Education Center in Houston, recently quoted some alarming numbers while addressing educators at the Unlocking C Literacy Conference at the University of Houston. 49% of prison inmates are dyslexic. 70% of prison inmates are functioning illiterate. 85% of adjudicated youth are reading below grade level. The reality is identifying and properly treating dyslexia makes us all stakeholders. Remember the families that do not have the extra money or time to fix the dyslexia. They're relying on us to step up and put as many resources as we can to help the dyslexic students within our mighty district. Second subject, compliance versus commitment. It was as recent as 2013 that districts were finally required to identify dyslexic students and teens. TEA recently made a video which took a deep dive into HB3 and how it relates to, to dys dyslexia. Within this video, TEA states that the state average for dyslexic identification is at 3.5%. I'm assuming that CISD is closely aligned with this very low percentage, well below the 20% actual dyslexic population that is widely accepted as the more accurate percentage of dyslexic <laughs> students within our district. Last spring, HB3 was passed and is marked as a piece of historic school finance legislation. I would like to discuss HB3 as it relates to dyslexic students. For the first time ever, districts will begin receiving money for identified dyslexic and dysgraphia students that is identified in PEMS. The TEA video that I mentioned earlier states districts will receive $616 per identified dyslexic and dysgraphia student. At the 3.5%, that is 2,261 identified dyslexic students in our district, which is approximately 1.4 million in new funding for our dyslexia department this year. If we could raise that percentage to 10% identified dyslexic students, that would bring us to 6,462 identified students, which is approximately 4 million in new funding for our dyslexia department. Compliance keeps us at or close to the state average. Commitment requires us to greatly increase our percentage of identified dyslexics and to become forerunners to other districts in our state. Commitment requires us to take an uncomfortably close look at how we are identifying, treating, and honoring our dyslexic students in our district. Commitment requires a vision for extreme growth of our dyslexia department to include greatly increasing our staff that is trained in dyslexia services. Commitment requires we begin to properly train SPED teachers <clears throat> that are working with dyslexic students in special education. Commitment requires that we begin to provide mandatory dyslexia awareness training for general ed teachers. Success is not an accident. Fidelity to implementation is a must. Pilots are failures. We must feel the pressure to change. As a fellow stakeholder, I am 100% committed to helping our mighty district make these changes. Please tell me what I can do to help. I would like to know how we plan to use the additional funding through HB3 and our vision of extreme growth to our district's dyslexia population. I will leave you with a quote from Dr. Art Cavasso, superintendent of Harlingen CISD. The American dream is only accessible if you are literate. Thank you for your time and dedication to all dyslexic students in our district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Fusca. Hello. Let me first start off by saying I used to be a high school teacher. I have the utmost respect for education, Connor ISD, and the people on this board. What I do not have respect for is how this body of Connor ISDs treats students with special needs. My son has autism, is in the fourth grade, and we've been trying since he was in kindergarten to get him into special education so we can give him the help he desperately needs, help that is his right, that is legal obligations to get. The response has always been his behavior is age appropriate. And they're putting in place Title IV accommodations. This year, the second we said our son needs more help, his accommodations are not working. He needs to be in special education. We were immediately stonewalled. My email stopped getting answered, and the school stalled. I've emailed many in this room begging for help, and 
all I have heard is silence. The school response to our request is to put my son on yet another 504 plan and to put in place accommodations that have not worked since kindergarten. The frustrating part of this is Connor ISD's own policies clearly state if 504 accommodations aren't working, that student has to be has to be has to be referred to special education. Also, according to the child fine law, um, my son should have been should have been identified in kindergarten for a student who needs special needs services, special education services. By his school's own admission, my son is not getting any better. If anything, he is getting worse. He went from a straight A student to an AB student to barely passing the fourth grade, and still we are denied special education services. My son is continually bullied, <coughs> and nothing is done to his students to all the bullies. In fact, his main tormentor is in his class this year again, and we were assured they would not be in the same class. His school's response to all this has been to hide behind district policies, policies they are clearly violating. My son cries every morning because he doesn't want to go to school. In his own words, kids keep on messing with me and I have to sit by myself in the front of the classroom. The school's response has been to isolate my son, not help him. This district is telling my son. Connor ISD on this board wants voters to approve $23.8 million to artificial turf, but yet they deny special needs students the services they desperately need. This goes to show where your priorities really are. I recently read a newspaper article telling the superintendent's number one priority is students and staff mental health. Where is the help for my son? I feel for my son's physical safety and his mental well-being. The truly sad part to the saga is a child with my son's disability. Early intervention is a key to helping him lead a normal life. Thanks to Connor ISD stalling tactics, that window has closed. The most we can hope for is to give him some, some coping strategies so he can function somewhat normally in today's society. The way you are neglecting students with special needs is unethical and morally reprehensible. And I say shame on you who are on this board. It is up to you, it is your job to oversee Connor ISD and make sure this never happens. I am not the first parent to stand up here and address on the board on this issue. I hope I am the last. All of you up here went into education, whether you're a teacher, a board member, an administrator, because you want to help kids. You want to make a difference. When did you lose that vision you had? When did you lose that passion? When did your job just become a paycheck? When did you put the bottom line ahead of the student's civil rights and, and their well-being? Amber like my husband, Fusca. I'm sorry, I was just going to say your name, Amber Fusca. Like my husband, I have a background in education with a degree in liberal studies. Because of our backgrounds, we both assume that the people involved in our child's education would have his best interest at heart. After the past five years, I've come to the belief that this is the farthest thing from the truth. I could stand here and cite example after example of how Connor ISD has failed my child. But I'm going to share just one. My son was in special education last year. We asked the school to provide special education busing for our child this year. We were told we would have to remove our child from special education to get him special education busing. Let me say that again for the people in the back. I had to remove my child from special education to get him special education busing. That is the perfect summation of the bureaucracy and the insanity that we have been facing for the last five years. This needs to stop. And just to clarify, he was in special education for speech, which again took us three years to get him that because it came back every year as age appropriate. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Ashley Fair Fairley. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm here today to also raise awareness for dyslexia um, because it's Dyslexia Awareness Month. I'm also a Conroe High School alumni. Um, so I've been in the district for a while. Um, I'm pro district. One thing I'm very, two things I'm passionate about is PTO and supporting the schools in any way I can and dyslexia. 
could talk both about both all day, so I won't do that. My journey with dyslexia started with when my daughter was in kindergarten. I knew something was off, but when I would go to her teachers each year, I was told she's, you know, she's fine. Just keep working with her. She'll get there. She's not, you know, everything's, you know, not developmentally there yet. By the time I got to second grade and we weren't progressing in her reading, and at this point, her self-esteem started to suffer. She was really struggling with friendships and we had lots of tears and spelling tests were excruciatingly painful. Um, I went to the teachers and I had a conference and I was told she was fine. She was just an average B student. I was just brushed off. I honestly thought the teachers thought I was one of those parents just freaking out over the first B. Um, that was not the case. Um, elementary are your foundational years, and I was reading with my daughter at home, and we weren't getting anywhere. Um, my husband would fall asleep trying to read with her because he was trying. we would have to help with every other word. Um, so once my teachers told me there weren't any concerns, she was on the DRA level at that time, I decided, okay, next step, go to the principal. So called the meeting with the principal, and at that point, I was told she was just right above that at-risk category um, based on her COAG testing scores. And so I, you know, their hands were tied and I understand there, there is bureaucracy and different things you have to go through um, by the state, not district, by the state. <laughs> so I do understand that. Um, so I asked the principal, okay, so if your hands are tied and you can't do anything yet, if we do testing on our own, will you acknowledge the results? And I was told that they would. So we spent about $2,000 to have her tested, you know, with a neurologist for ADD, with an educational diagnostician for testing, and it did come back. She had dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. So that was the middle of her second grade year. We were not able to get a, dys a 504 in place until the end of her second grade. Um, we started her in private tutoring right away. I was happy just to have that 504 in place for the beginning of third grade, knowing that was her first testing year. So that was crucial to have that at that point. I quickly learned as a parent that um, you have to advocate for your own child. Um, the teachers are not aware of what allowable accommodations that there is available to dyslexia students, according to our TEA website. So I had to start educating myself um, with the help of my mother-in-law, who's a retired CISD teacher, um, about the accommodations. And so as soon as I started to get those accommodations in place, as well as with the dyslexia program, my daughter started to improve slowly. Um, fast forward to last year in fifth grade where she was really struggling with math. And then I learned, oh, a calculator is available under the dyslexia accommodations. Nobody told me that. So just by adding that one little accommodation, her star math testing court score jumped by 20%. Um, and so I've spent my time like reaching out, meeting other parents with dyslexia students, educating them on accommodations um, that are allowable for, for these students. Um, and it's we have amazing teachers <laughs> in this district who love our kids and want to see them succeed. I am with a lot of them every day. Um, you know, it's not for, for lack of trying, it's just they simply don't know. And I, I'm aware that CISD provides a lot of in-house training um, trainings for the teachers. My wish for this district would be would to be for, just like Nicole said, that we provide training for the teachers on dyslexia, the warning signs. It's not you, reversing letters and reading backwards. Those are not what dyslexia is. My daughter was reading by memory alone um, she had no phonetic ability to break down and decode words. And that's what the dyslexia program helps them do. Um, so if one in five students are dyslexic as a district, we need to help these teachers identify these children earlier on. They're, it's identifiable at age five. Instead of wait until third grade, which is the first testing years, which ultimately affects our district. So if we could implement um, required training for teachers, um, to help them identify the warning signs. Thank you. And we're an exemplary district. I would love to see CISD a set of presidents for other schools in our area to how to handle dyslexia better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Eric Yalek. Hi, my name is Eric Yalek. I live in the Woodlands and um, I had a visitor to my law office today by the name who identified himself at least as Jack the Sticker. And he is a 28 year old person, has an earring, Caucasian, and he asked me if I would read a statement and treat his identity as confidential and I agreed to do so and so that's what I'm going to do this evening. My name is Jack the Sticker. I'm a group of eight individuals, which includes two current employees of Conroe ISD. We are protesting the complete lack of morality and the total abandonment of education as a purpose of CISD's board and its administration. You're interested in spending money to build your own power on the backs of children, teachers, and taxpayers of this school district. You criticize Kelly Cook, Scott Shaver, and other leaders of the Children's Hope Pack for their efforts to fight the $677.3 million zombie bond when you intentionally hide information to try to mask the fact that the bond package is really nothing but the same as the $807 million bond package the voters defeated on May the 4th. It's the same bond, except for the fact that you've hooked up with a Las Vegas casino family to subsidize their empty real estate development with a $39.4 million elementary school, the most expensive elementary school in CISD history. Ayn Rand wrote in June 1966, it is altruism that has corrupted and perverted human benevolence by regarding the giver as an object of immolation and the receiver as a helplessly miserable object of pity who holds a mortgage on the lives of others, a doctrine which is extremely offensive to both parties, leaving men no choice but the roles of sacrificial victim or moral cannibal. Your littering of school campuses with political signs advocating for the bond and the $50,000 of maintenance and operations funds you spent on those signs is little more than theft directly from taxpayers, your sacrificial victims who have had to pay you for fear of otherwise losing their homes to your lawyers and tax collectors. Those signs are an affront to the children of this school district. The money you spent on the signs and which trustee Skeeter Hubert tried to hide from the citizens represent each a book a child could use to improve her reading a slide rule for learning ciphering skills, or a flask for a student's science experiment. You've admitted the bond will contribute nothing to educational outcomes, that the cost numbers in the bond package are ones you pulled from thin air, and in your own expensively hired demographic study that one, we don't need new schools in CISD for eight years, and two, you intend to rezone schools in the district whether the bond package passes or not. It's all in writing. Shame on you for your fluxinocin nihilopilification of education and of morality. You've turned homework assignments, school carpool lines, emergency text message contacts for parents, PTO meetings, open houses, and even the private backpacks of children into political tools for you to try to manipulate voters. Look in the mirror. You'll see anything but educators. More likely, you'll see Ayn Rand's moral cannibals. And Jack the Sticker has asked me, he also gave me a present for each of you, a sticker, which he asked me to hand to each of you. And I'll just hand it to the secretary so that you can distribute it to the members of the board. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jack. <coughs> you keep it down there. <laughs> Ms. Scott. Christy Swoboda. TSTA Conroe wants you to know, Dr. Nall and the board, we understand the district was watching the weather very carefully on September 19th, and that with a wife working for the district and a daughter attending Conroe High School, Dr. Nall would not have knowingly put anyone in harm's way. 
I was headed to Sam Houston State that morning for a class. Um, I, at 6.45, I left my house at Stewart's Forest. It was sprinkling. By the time I got to the front of the neighborhood, it was raining steadily. By the time I made the short distance from the front of my neighborhood to I-45, it was torrentially downpouring. I got up on there and was gonna go and then said no and uh, made the mistake of exiting Wilson Road where I spent the next three hours enjoying the view of everyone else trying to get by on 45. While I was there, I was glad to immediately get the notice that we were canceling school that day and that none of the buses for the elementary school children had left. Um, tropical storms rarely follow the path or <coughs> intensity that they're supposed to, and we understand that that day it was very apparent. We also thank you for your efforts in keeping the facts of the bond issue available on the website. We thank the board for your unpaid time and efforts on behalf of the students and staff of the district. Together, we're getting better all the time, and we appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Garfer. All right. Um, item three, consent agenda. Gentlemen, I have not received any requests to remove anything. Are we okay with that? Yes. Move right. acceptance of the consent agenda as presented. I have second. a motion, second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? This an agenda passes. Thank you. Item four, curriculum and instruction. Item 4A, receive instructional material selection process overview. Dr. No. All right, this time I'll ask Dr. Ethan <coughs> Upshaw to come forward to present this item. Good evening. President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, thank you for providing our CNI <coughs> department some time this evening to provide for you an overview of this year's information of our state's proclamation for the 2020 and our district's instructional material process. If you remember last year, we came to you around the same time, and at last year, what we adopted was the kinder through eighth English language arts. So this time around, we're gonna be adopting our second half of that, which is the high school, this high school, um, English English one through four, the electives for those subjects, and also um, an adoption for our English language learners at these grade levels. So as part of the state's instructional material selection process for this school year, teachers from each campus in the school district are selected to look at, um, that teach the subject matter are selected to review these items as part of the adoption. They're given an opportunity to review the materials with an evaluation that we provide for them. Then those teachers' evaluations are, and we've had many successes over the year, then come to a district selection committee that's listed there for you, that's a representative from all our high schools and junior highs and also special education ELL teachers. They come together, look at those evaluations, and then we make a suggestion to you. So we look at coming sometime during October to be able to do that. And in addition to the teacher evaluation process, we also have um, material showcase where the publishers are able to exhibit their materials where all teachers in the district are invited and for the last couple of years we've opened this showcase to enabling school districts as well so they can um, attend it and then we also have an opportunity for our community to be able to give comments on these materials and that's available at our tech our attack which is our assessment center from December 5th all the way to January 17th of this school year so people in the audience help us with this process. It's just not members of the CNI department and they're here with us today. I'd like to recognize them. Um, since this is a secondary adoption, um, Mr. or Dr. Dr. Chris Hines helps oversee the whole process, but Mr. Greg Colshin uh, assists us with that. Dr. Tamika Taylor and her department. Mrs. Terry Ross helps us with all the ends of the, that this stuff we buy works with our technology. We also have Ms. Darren Carlisle, which helps us with our ELO portion of it. And Ms. Dana Boyer, if she's in the room, also helps us with the evaluations and the whole process of it. Do we have any questions? Got a couple questions. Okay. What kind of what kind of response do you get from the community? When you said you open this up to the community, what, and they're allowed to, to give comments what kind of comments do you get? So to make sure that it's advertised and the community has an opportunity, we do make sure to communicate with Sarah Blakelock so she puts this out in um, newspaper avenue so that the community can know it's available. The last couple of years, we haven't had any response. No response, mm -hmm. okay. And it's, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but the high school English one through four, that you're, the curriculum, what guidelines do you follow? Like we follow TEKS, correct? Yes. Okay. So that is the guaranteed curriculum, the curriculum we must teach. So we have to teach that. Yes. Okay. And so what you're doing is you're putting, you're putting stuff together that's mandated by the state of Texas. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. A little bit off the, off the subject. And if it's too far and it's out of line, just tell me. And it's really okay. It, it has more to do with, in, instead of instructional materials, like where the teachers are, are the staff training. Yes. I mean, I consider those two linked very closely uh -huh. okay so you you get these materials but in your training during the summer and in, 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 in teacher work days and other times that you you do it <clears throat> do uh, I hear about districts sending groups of teachers places and we don't seem to do that mm -hmm. and I mean I've been told before you go or Mika goes or Darren goes, or somebody goes. Debbie maybe goes. Doc, excuse me, Doc Phillips. And they, and they, and they go to Seattle, and it's one airfare, and they're trained, and they come back and do the training for four thousand teachers, or four hundred teachers, or however many <coughs> that are it's it's appropriate for. Is, do you see that as a working? I mean, can Debbie bring the information back and teach it as well as the people in Seattle? I'm, no okay. offense, Dad. I'm not picking on you. I just <laughs> better, I, you, better. You understand because I see, I see it as a, it, it is really important that we have these strategies and so on and so forth that we actively see on our field trips and visits to schools. You know, if it's poster math or this or the, the writing and you know, really a pickup in writing last year and so on and so forth, and we know that that's not by accident. That's not all. That's all the teachers being on the same page. Uh -huh. So my question at the end of all that garbage is, 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 is it working? Well, yeah. I would say it is working. It's the most cost effective way for our school district for us to send trainer of trainers to these places. And it's not always just district staff. I want you to know sometimes it is campus staff, but we have actively looked in um, to actually this year, we have actually brought the training here. And so instead of paying for an individual teacher to go to a training that might cost us five to $6,000, We've done, because we've spoken to the people that are, the, um, you know, like Teachers College. It helps us with reading and writers workshop. And they also have a phonetic uh, material that we get, we're helping with the K-1-2 to make sure how to unpack those words when they're little. We have actually worked with them to bring days here, not to go to New York, but bring days here where we're able to now bring 30 teachers in each grade level here. And we did that collaboratively with neighboring school districts, like large Houston area school districts. We've also done that for our instructional coaches and principals this year. So for the cost of what would be six teachers to go to New York, we are now training probably 225 teachers. Nice. So we are consistently looking at the cost of effective way to do that. And we wanna make sure that we also deliver it in spurts, right? Just like when you're learning something new, you can't just get all the content. So we have to feed it a little bit at a time and take teachers where they're at because we train 600 new teachers a year. So we do have to make sure that we have, and we're equipped that way to implement that from year to year to year. That's why you'll see it when you go to cl from classroom to classroom with that and, fidelity. And so with, with that training and the effectiveness that you proclaim, okay, and this instructional material, are they on the same page? So and, aren't, I'm and sorry. Granted, this is a secondary thing. And I know, mm -hmm. you know, it crosses many boundaries and different, different strategies for different age groups, but. You, you, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. Is this working for us? I mean, I see our schools. I see how we're ranked against other districts. I know something's working, but is this working? I think it is working effectively. Are there areas of growth? Absolutely. Are there teachers that might not get it and might need individual coaching? Absolutely. Just like kiddos sometimes need another small group. So it really depends on those teachers, that grade level. Sometimes we might have a brand new English one team right, with two veterans and then they're all new. So it really depends on the years, right, when we go on campuses and we help them. And it's, it's, it's differentiated staff development, just like it is differentiated learning for our kiddos. Our responsibility with bringing you forward this 
material or this item tonight for you to review is that our job is to look at these instructional materials to make sure they're aligned to the curriculum that we are to teach, which are the TEKS. Do they teach them at the best level? For the most part, they do, or we wouldn't be spending district money on it. However, are there ways to supplement that? Absolutely. Some teachers can create some great lesson plans that take it further. Well, and we have many other programs too. That, yes. That, that supplement. Supplementary resources. Yes, sir. Thank you for your answer. Absolutely. And your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Okay. And your Thank effort. You. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Um, item 4B received the. Are we still? We're good? Yes. Okay. Um, received the 2018 2019 Texas Accountability Summary and the TEL PAS uh, results. Oh, Mr. Dr. Husbands, you, you teed this one up beautifully. Um, this time we'll have Dr. Hines and Dr. Upshaw and Dr. Taylor come forward to uh, present our accountability results from last year. Thank you very much, um, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Um, and, and just as Dr. Noll mentioned, um, we'll start with accountability as a good summary of how are we doing. And, uh, and as Dr. Upshaw just shared, uh, certainly there's areas that we celebrate and we were, you know, we're, we're feeling good about. And there's always areas too that we look at the data and we want to study and, and, and really understand how we can improve and want to get better. So we're on this journey of constantly working to get better. Uh, so we want to share a little bit of, of this information with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Upshaw. We'll talk a little bit about Telpass. Before she does that, I do want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Darren Carlisle is with us tonight. Ms. Carlisle is our coordinator of our bilingual ESL programs. And so uh, we're glad that she's here. So make sure I ask all educators in the room to stand up because this is going to be a celebration that we're about to present. And it's because of you. So if you would stand up, thank you all. So I will begin with the overview of the TELPASS, which is the T Texas English Language Proficiency Assessment System. So part of the Every Student Succeeds Act accountability system for our English learners, states must show annual increase in the progress that our EELs make in learning English from year to year and how they're attaining that second language proficiency. So there are four language domains in which we assess our students, and that is in the listening, the speaking, the reading, and the writing. And there are four proficiency levels that our English learners can achieve. It's begin their beginning, intermediate, and advanced, and advanced high. So to give you a little fee uh, some summary of the features that each proficiency level has. So a beginning student is a student that's a recent arrival, might be anywhere from zero to a year. Sometimes we call this the silent period when there's very little English because they're just soaking it all in. Um, so their English ability is very limited. At the intermediate level, there's limited ability, but they understand simple language structures like common language that the teacher will use in a read aloud or shared reading. They can monitor that, or they can do that in their reading. They can also do that in their writing. High frequency words that we use like I, see, the, we, you know, that you see all the time in, in literacy. And then also routine contexts. We also have advanced, this grade level appropriate, but still with second language support. So they're still going back and forth in the language and still kind of maybe need to go back to their native language to be able to translate that. So they still need some support there. And then our advanced high students. These are the students that are right at that cusp. They are be able to read that literature review at the ninth grade level, just like any other student. And most of the cases are advanced and advanced high students are high enough to perform very well on the English star and exit out of the program. So what Ms. Carlisle put together for us here today is a summary of our TELPASS scores for the entire district. So one thing to know about this, as you can see, you have different grade levels and right by that, for example, there's 833 kindergartners in this cohort that was tested last year and how they rated in each proficiency. But one thing to know about this population is it's very mobile. So we might have students that come in and come out, but it's so it's very hard sometimes to keep it as a cohort, like maybe like we would do with graduation rate that Dr. Taylor will review here in a minute. Sometimes when we move kids from one level from beginning to inter intermediate, not all kids will move because they're not all in the same cohort. So the goal here for us in the accountability system that Dr. Uh, Taylor will go into a little bit further is for our kids to achieve one proficiency level, one or more a year. So I just wanna let you know that the recent literature for English language learners says it takes five to seven, sometimes up to eight years for children to acquire this language. 
So when you see here, if you have a beginning, intermediate, advanced events high, that's four years. So sometimes it doesn't happen overnight, right? To really get to that advanced level or even advanced, advanced, advanced high, it takes a couple of years for our students to get there. So this is one area in our academic, uh, academic performance that we did not meet the target. However, we've already worked on some systems and looking at some things to put in place, Mrs. Carlisle and, um, and her instructional coaches and our administrators are looking to be able to help this with our students. They kind of changed the game a little bit on us this year. And what we realized is the assessment used to be where teachers evaluate it. Now kiddos have to record themselves into a system. And then an evaluator says if their English is at that level. So two things, we need to teach our kids how to do that, right? Because a first grader might not do that all the time. And then another thing is there were some technology implications that we have to get better at with our kiddos. But that summarizes our um, TELPASS results. And I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Taylor to talk about our accountability. Dr. Upshaw, real quick, you talked about the technology. Do you have the technology? We just need to teach the kids. Yeah, we we do have oh. the technology. We just have to teach kiddos. It's just you know it's hard to manipulate, and they put two pictures up of different animals and <coughs> descriptive. So okay. you know they're first graders, second graders. We just got to teach it to them. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. You bet. Good evening. I'll first start out with a brief overview of the accountability system. As you are aware, we are under a domain system now, and we are uh, basically um, using the three domains to figure out if campuses are performing the way they should be. Our first domain is student achievement, and then we have domain two, which is school progress, which looks at academic growth and relative performance, and then domain three, closing the gaps, which is our state and federal accountability. So what you see on the screen is really a bunch of numbers, but what's very telling here is our district's overall score this year was a 89B. And the reason we were a 89B, as you will see on the screen, is because we were capped out at a 89 because we had one or more campus that received a DRF in domains one and two. So districts are rated based on an A through F in each domain in addition to campuses. So our goal this year is to make sure that we are very proactive in making sure we are assisting those campuses so that our district can be seen in its true light, which would have been a 91 overall A. With that, and going back to domain three, closing the gaps, that's real huge for us for high school because a part of that indicator is something that's fairly new called the College Career and Military Readiness Indicator. And you may have heard of the acronym CCMR. In this indicator, our goal is to make sure that our students are college ready, career ready, and military ready. And the way that is gauged is the number of kids that are passing some of these uh, TSI criteria exams, which includes SAT, ACT, college prep courses, dual credit, and so forth. And then the area of career ready, we're looking at students that earn uh, level one or level two certificates, such as welding and in the CTE strand. And then for military ready readiness, we're looking at our students that are enlisted in the United States Armed Force Services. So when I go back to just view how we did as a, a district for domain one, which is student achievement, and also include some of those CCMR indicators and our graduation rate. When we compare ourselves to the state of Texas, we scored an 89 in this domain, whereas the state scored a 75 in that domain. When we look at domain two, student progress, this part of domain two is about academic growth. And it is how much growth our students are making from fourth grade to 12th grade in the areas of reading and math. And as you will see, we scored an 85, whereas the state scored a 79 in domain two. Domain three, closing the gaps, is a little bit more complicated to explain, so I'll just walk you through it. Basically, for domain three, this is, again, the state and federal component, and we are evaluated in domain three based on 14 student groups, and each one of the 14 student groups are, are evaluated on four components, as you will see on the screen, academic achievement, growth, graduation, tell past what Dr. Upshaw just uh, discussed, and then school quality and student success. So when you look at those indicators, and I know this looks a little busy, but let me walk you through it as well. What the state and federal government does is they set targets for each student group. 
And I know you can't see this, but I'll just kind of call out some of them. For example, these targets are set at the meets passing standard, and they vary dep depending on the student group for the kid. And what the, the state and federal government says is that you have to meet a certain percentage of these indicators to make your domain three score. And so when you look at the possible 96 indicators for domain three, 51 of these indicators are used in district accountability. So looking at those 51 indicators, as a district, we met 45 out of the 51 indicators, which gave us a weighted score in domain three of an 88B. We are aware that there are uh, subgroups that we are focusing on, and, and our focus for those subgroups are the indicators that we did not meet. And for those subgroups, we did not meet three in the area of math for growth. We did not meet five subgroups for graduation. And then we did not meet our subgroup for tail pass. Just to give you more information about graduation, the target is set at 90%. And we did have out of those five subgroups, some of those subgroups met the target, but what the state and, and, and ESSA requires is that when you get to 90% of your graduation rate, you have to maintain it by at least a tenth of a point the following year. So we may have subgroups that scored over 90% and still need to maintain it at least by a tenth of Dr. a percentage Taylor. point. Dr. Taylor, yes, sir. could you tell me again what those subgroups are? The subgroups are the 14 student groups, which include our seven racial and ethnic groups listed on this screen, our economically disadvantaged students, students receiving special education, formerly receiving special education, current and monitored students, students who uh, were in an EL program and are, have been out of an EL program for at least four years, students who are considered continuously enrolled, and students who are considered non-continuously enrolled. Okay. And Dr. Taylor, just for, for clarification, students can be counted in more than one of those sub Exactly. So the, if, if they don't meet their standard, that could actually be count as a fail in, in four multiple or five sub -pops. different subpops. Yes, okay. sir. That is correct. So just like districts receive a letter grade under the A through F accountability system, campuses receive a letter grade as well. So as you will see on the screen, our overall letter grades for our campuses in our district, we had 21 A's, 24 B's, 10 C's, two campuses with an overall rating of a D, and we did not have any campuses with an overall rating of an F, which is a celebration for us, because as you will recall, Houston Elementary was an F campus, and I am happy to report they are now a C campus. Awesome. With the accountability system, campuses are eligible for distinctions. And distinctions are when these campuses perform in the top quartile of their 40 comparison groups throughout the state. So out of our 56 eligible campuses, 44 earned distinctions. Of the 44 campuses that earned distinctions, 29 earned distinctions in two or more areas, and 17 earned distinctions in three or more areas. So we've shared a lot of information, <clears throat> but really this is kind of the beginning of uh, probably some ongoing dialogue uh, in all these areas. Um, coming soon in November, we will be back and uh, we've, we've mentioned that there's certainly things that we're targeting for improvement. We'll be back to ask for your approval of our district improvement plan, which even though you're approving it, it is a work in progress. And so it's something that we're always gonna have to go back and keep looking at, as well as our campus plans will come forward next month. Um, we also will bring forward for your approval the targeted improvement plan for Houston Elementary School. Previously, if you, a couple of years ago, you improved uh, a plan, a turnaround plan, um, but now we're doing a targeted improvement plan because we obviously want to keep working with Houston, so we don't want to go backwards. Uh, and then in December, also in November, I'll mention, uh, you heard a lot about the CCMR, the College and Career and Military Readiness, um, and you'll hear... Uh, more information from Mr. Colshin in November where he does his uh, annual report and give you an update on many of those indicators that are included in the CCMR. So that'll be coming in November. And then December, we'll also be back for uh, target improvement plans for the two schools that receive Ds. And so um, Creighton and San Jacinto, those plans, uh, again, we're, we're gonna put plans together because we don't wanna be in the F category. And so 
we certainly want to take steps and, and move forward. So, so those are plans, or when you say how should be, that, that's your decision to put those plans in place as opposed to an F-rated campus is the state's decision. So the state we input into the state system, and then the local ones we don't submit into their system, but we, we have locally. Dr. Hines, I have a question about the 10 C's. Are any of those, uh, were they were they downgraded from last year? There, there are some that move both ways, but okay. certainly we're looking at um, we're looking at all campus performance and certainly areas that we can target for improvement. Okay, and it's something that's part of those campus improvement plans. And and you know that's just something else that we've been talking about, having discussions for the last couple of years about really, um, you know, transforming our planning process to be more inclusive and, and follow this effective schools framework. And we we've tried to do that, but it's. Uh, expanded and we found it to be very successful when we're using it and so it's something that we're really trying to implement with all of our schools now. I agree with that. I think that each campus is going to be unique but there's probably similarities that you can use to identify those campuses that have fallen and what made them fall and what we can do to raise them back up. I know this board went through a long process with Houston uh, because we all wanted to have that campus succeed and Congratulations to everyone involved in that. That was a great effort to go up, but I'd like to see us, as you're doing, continue to monitor and work to try to take those C's to B's and the, you know, the, the D's to, to C's to B's to A's. I, I'd like to see us do better. I think, I think as, as a district, we have that culture of continuous improvement and always trying to do better than we did yesterday. And I, uh, I just want to say I appreciate all of you and the staff uh, for all their efforts in that regard. Well, and I'd just like to ask a question because some of these campuses that, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to single anybody out, but <clears throat> I know for a fact it's the best of the best are, have either, are either there or have been moved there, okay? And we'll just leave it at that, okay? I'm talking about leadership. And yet they continue to struggle. Is that being dealt the hand of, of some, I mean, let's face it, it's harder to get improvement out of somebody that doesn't speak English in our schools, mm -hmm. I would think, than it would be somebody that speaks English. I mean, it, that that's a slower progress, is it not? I mean, it is. I mean, it, it, it's is certain. it percentage of, of English learners or is it, uh, is it just... Uh, is it socioeconomics? Is it, I mean, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of things that go into this, and we won't go down that road. But um, if if you have good leadership, and and it's proven leadership, and that school continues to struggle, C, B to C, D to C, back to D, you know, I don't know, whatever the situation is, what 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 is the answer? I guess I mean, if you knew that, I guess it'd be fixed, right? I got it. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm saying, is there is there anything that, uh, that is there a thread of, of similarity through there that makes this happen? Well, there's there is, and, and certainly there's information that we look at. And so, I want to start with we're always looking at the data, right? We're going to study the data. What where are we performing? Where are we struggling? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? But you you touched on many areas, Mr. Husbands, and 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 they're all important. We talk about school culture talk about the importance of creating that culture. We talked about staff development tonight, the importance of bringing our staff up to where we want them to be. Uh, because keep in mind, not only we're we dealing with students that are changing all the time, we, we deal with changing staff all the time. And so we're, we're really trying to renorm and, and, and pick up where we're going from, from where we are. Um, I think, you know, you've talked about uh, quality instruction, um, you know, quality curriculum. Uh, we've talked about meaningful data. And then you touched on a really important one, leadership and, and the person who, who runs that all and coordinates it and, and really is charged with leading that, that, that whole process. And something that we, and we do a lot of internal discussion and planning as a group. And, and I work with an outstanding team. I want to acknowledge Dr. Winkler, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Upshaw, all four of these people were great part of this whole Houston process. And we, we have a team that, that is, Part of that whole approach with all of our schools, Mr. Colshin works very closely with Dr. Upshaw of the secondary schools. And so we know where it's a work in progress, but you're talking about leadership is one of them as well. And I think 
we, we recognize the importance of developing our leaders, just as important as developing our teachers, um, just as important as having these processes in place where we're constantly looking at our data, making adjustments, coming back and, and whether it's a training issue, whether it's uh, getting the right materials, you know, whatever we need to do, we want to be responsive to that. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. There's a lot of things that go into this accountability system that, that have its challenges. Um, CCMR is one of those that we're learning about. We, you know, we probably were, you know, we learned about a system and the system was already in place. So we went up this year in CCMR. We think we'll go up again next year and we think we can go up again the year after. So I think you'll see continuous improvement as we, as we refine our processes as well. I've heard a lot of comments about Houston tonight. And I, I know uh, Dr. Taylor probably didn't see the inside of her office this year. She spent so much time at, at that campus. And God bless you for your success. But, I mean, it's not just the C. Because it, it was a few years ago we were looking at Austin. And, Absolutely. And, and a C at Austin is a victory. I mean, you know, it, it's still moving in the right direction. Oh, to the best of my knowledge, let me put it Absolutely. that way. But uh, there's there's other grades. It's not just the letter grade. You know, it's it's the progress or the improvement or the performance or the or the we're on a roll here. You know, we missed it by one point. We're not making excuses when we say that, but it is we're we're, we're looking constantly at, at the uh, at the numbers to to show that we're improving. I, I was just I'm just looking for something that I guess if you know I would have I'd have the magic pill if I had it, but. You know what? What is the thread that, that, that you know that, that it, makes it? And you tough? and you touched on. I mean, there's always challenges. Certainly, we have with students where we have higher mobility. We have challenges certainly where we have students acquiring English language, uh, and certainly socioeconomics is another uh, factor. But um, as well, and I pointed this out in the past. Probably one of the things that that you know that that I've noticed long ago when we looked at the data, especially in the area of school improvement, remember the most typical configuration for our elementary schools is pre-K to four, with only gives our elementaries one year of index two growth. And so we also play with a small cohort of data set. And, uh, and so it's something that we know that um, what that means is very few students can impact your letter grade for school. And because of the, because we configure K to four, and it's just something that we understand. It's not an excuse. It's just something that we deal with in our system. I know we're not talking star here, but you know, it, it's sixth grade. It has to all be English, right? I mean, English there star. There is no yes. Spanish. There's no Spanish version. Yes, version of the test. Let me put it that way. Yes, sir. So if they come to you in the beginner category in sixth grade, I mean, is, are you? automatically sunk. I mean, you know, but just because they can't pass the test in English. Well if they show up year one, we get a we have an exemption, exemption. for one year for one year. For one year. So they can they can learn the English language in one year. I'm, I'm, I'm sixty years old and I'm not sure I got it down. It's but uh, anyway. If I can Thank just, you. I, we we can move on. I, I'm just it just it's the uh, y'all y'all's progress. I don't think the letter grade is the only answer. And I, I know that's not I mean, I'm not I'm not saying anything about what Mr. Sanders said. I, I want to continue to see improvement too. Uh, you know, uh, that's what we're here for. But there's more behind these letters absolutely than absolutely. Than, than, yes. than, the, than the sheet shows. And and I just I just want to thank each and every one of you, Darren. I know y'all worked so hard this year. So anyway. the, the letter the letter grades are an attempt to simplify a system. I, I but as you've talked about, it's a it's so complex but, you know, that on, a letter doesn't can't afford to make excuses either. Right. And I and everybody I, else compete on the same right. wavelength and we need to be better. And I do want to just and make, I think we are. I want to make one point just because I could I could hear Dr. Pearson right now. Austin has a B. Uh, oh, you said C. And Dr. Pearson, yeah, she yeah, could show up here at any moment. And if we want to make sure we get that right. Uh, yeah. they, they've worked really hard there, too. Yeah, I made her mad once yeah. before. I don't want to do that again. Indeed. I apologize. <laughs> All the more celebration. Indeed. Yes. There, and, and really, I don't want that to be lost. That there's a lot to celebrate in, in that performance. No. Um, and we we, we, we all want to continue to improve, but there's also some celebration there. Uh, a couple other reminders, and really this is the last one I'll mention, is House Bill 3 is a new uh, legislation, and uh, we're still receiving information about um, this new law and what, what the impact is. But one of the areas that we know is coming is that we will have to have three required plans in place 
uh, this school year, so before the school year is over, uh, and that is for early childhood in the areas of uh, kindergarten through second grade, literacy and math proficiency. So, you know, STAR covers grades three up, um, and so the state is now um, requiring that we have a system in place to where we can measure proficiency that we will report to you on a regular basis. There's also going to be an initiative for uh, elementary uh, literacy that's going to be uh, a rather large, we have a two-year uh, window to do that training and, and implement that plan. So there's a lot coming with House Bill 3, but, but certainly this year, during the year, we will come back to you with a, uh, a plan, an improvement plan, some goals for you to look at and improve. Uh, we also will do the same thing with the college and career and military readiness. So those are changes this year. These are things that, to look for in the future. Coming soon, we're going to get more information from the state. We haven't received all of that information yet, but uh, this is one of these bills that has a lot of far-reaching impact, and uh, we will see some more information. Dr. Hines. Yes, sir. Just I've got to ask a question because of the House Bill 3 on literacy. I heard dyslexia mentioned a couple of times with House Bill 3. Does this also, does it, is there something set aside for dyslexia as well? In this bill, in well, there's there's a dyslexia piece to this bill, but um, but obviously that would probably be included, and I think it's a big push behind the early childhood K to two assessment and formalizing those processes. Okay, just a quick, just a quick comment, kind of more of a, a praise and an encouragement. Is it, it? It seems to me that, and I echo what Mr. Sanders said about about Houston that one ingredient to the recipe of all these plans of improvement and what y'all did so incredibly well and in which I applaud y'all, but also applaud our community is how you got the community around Houston to step up. And I know you guys were going over for lunches and the whole community. And so my encouragement, I praise there, but my encouragement is in the other areas when these plans and improvement, don't forget that ingredient of those communities around those schools. Because I think in the incredible community that we live in here at CISD, I think that is a, a big factor in our success. So, yeah. You make an excellent great point. point. Yep. It takes a community. Yep. <coughs> Good job. Do you have any more questions or anything? Thank you, Thanks, Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. All right, administration item five, uh, receive information on school safety and security committee. Okay, Dr. Hines. <laughs> oh, you're back. Oh, no. get you Evening a again. <laughs> <laughs> New location. Who are you? <laughs> change it up here. Uh, tonight we're bringing forward for information, uh, we, some of which we discussed a little bit um, at the um, the school board training session. Just a kind of a quick update, Senate Bill 11, which was a rather uh, expansive school safety bill that was passed during this last legislative session, requires school districts to include certain members of their school safety and security committee. Texas Education Code 37.109 sets out that the required makeup of the committee. So in addition to the superintendent, the board president, uh, and one other board member, the committee must also include one or more representatives from the Office of Emergency Management, one or more representatives of local police agency, one or more representatives of the district's police department, two additional uh, superintendent designees, one of which must be a classroom teacher, and then two parents. So that sets out the minimum. We can have more than that. Um, there will be five primary tasks that this committee is charged with. One is to develop and implement emergency plans consistent with the district's multi-hazard emergency operations plan, to periodically provide recommendations to this board of trustees and administration regarding updating that district multi-hazard emergency operations plan, to provide any information needed in connection with a safety and security audit or report required under the law or other report that we submit to the Texas School Safety Center. We, we do submit an audit report every three years at the minimum. And to review any reports that will be submitted to the Texas School Safety Center to be sure the report contains accurate and complete information, as well as to consult with local law enforcement to increase the presence of law enforcement in our district schools. And so those are the five main tasks that this committee is charged with. Uh, and this is the committee that uh, 
Dr. Noah is putting together and uh, for to, to meet. Um, and you can see it includes President Williams, Mr. Scott Moore, Mr. Ray Sanders, myself, uh, Darren Hess, who is our director of Montgomery County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, uh, Damon Hall, the captain of Montgomery County Sheriff's Department, our chief harness, our captain Blakelock, and our and our local police department, uh, as well as Mr. Caker, Mr. Colson, Dr. Phillips, uh, Ethan Barton, who is our coordinator of school safety. Uh, Sharon Bailey, who's a classroom teacher at Clark, Sandra Young, who's a classroom teacher at Conroe High School, and then uh, two parents, Matt Benson and Amy Brown. And so this is the committee that will be meeting. This committee must meet at least three times a year, once each semester and once during the summer. And these meetings are subject to the Texas Open Meetings Act. Our first meeting is yet to be determined, but it will be coming soon because we're, this semester is starting to uh, happen pretty fast. So. Uh, Really the information for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, administration received capital improvement updates. Dr. No. Mr. Fox. Oh. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. No. It's my pleasure to bring you an update. On our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district, we we'll start you with Stockton Junior High. So Stockton is scheduled to open in August of 2020 and happy to report it is on schedule. Everything is rocking along like it should be. So the biggest improvement over the last month is the uh, completion of the solar fields. So you can see those uh, on the extreme ends of your picture here. So we've been working through the agreements with uh, Entergy on the, uh, the buyback of the energy that we don't use. Uh, the permanent meters are in place at the campus now, and we're commissioning the solar panel systems over the next couple of weeks. So we should start uh, utilizing that solar power uh, for our purposes uh, over the next month or so, and then start generating revenue on the on the energy that we don't use. Uh, so the important part is this is actually this investment is going to help us lower the bottom line on the overall construction project because energy use during construction goes directly to the uh, bottom line of the project. So the less energy we spend the less we'll actually spend on that campus and realize that in savings not only just on sold power but on power not not gener not used uh, off the grid for construction as we move around the building the focus of that building is really get in under a dry state so if you've been out there recently you've seen that the masonry progress around the front of the building is is uh, being executed uh, very quickly uh, and they're trying to make hay while the sun is shining so to speak the windows and other uh, other closer features are what are being installed now. So the frames have been in place, glass is going in place, so it is rapidly uh, approaching a dry condition. We expect it to be fully dry over the next two months or so. And on the inside, we're starting to see the building finishes, the colors, the personality of that building uh, being installed. Uh, you can see some of those things are going in place now. If you uh, had the opportunity to take a tour through it, it's really starting to take its shape. And I've had your report, like I said before, it is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2020. Now, at Connor High School, where we've talked about our building addition, which is allowing us to do the renovation, we've moved down to the ground floor, the oldest part of the building. And like uh, Stockton, you can see the personality of that, uh, the ground floor coming together. We've seen what the finishes will look like in the building addition and the second floor renovation that opened uh, for students this past uh, school year. Uh, so this building is scheduled to be uh, completed over uh, the next month or so. So uh, it'll be ready for students when they return from the winter break in January. So you can see now we're working on those finishes, the light fixtures, the ceiling grid, the, the uh, magnetic marker boards, the ceramic tile, the floors. The, I mean, so we're getting it ready uh, so we can receive furniture in the month of December and then open it for students in January. And that is our update. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, Mr. Fox. Outstanding job. All right. At this time, we will uh, take a recess for a uh, recess meeting for public hearing. Yes. Thank you, uh, President Williams. Uh, at this time, we're going to convene a public hearing for our Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, but we will receive a presentation from Ms. Karen Garza. At the conclusion of her presentation, there will be an opportunity for public comment. Uh, if you would like to make comment at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll ask you to come to the podium and state your name and keep your comments to two or three minutes. But at this time, we'll turn it over to Mrs. Garza. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Nall, and community members, it is my pleasure this evening to present the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas Annual Financial Management Report. 
The state, state School Financial Accountability Rating System, known as the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, or FIRST, ensures that Texas public schools are held accountable for the quality of their financial management practices and that they improve on those practices. The system is designed to encourage Texas public schools to better manage their financial resources to provide the maximum allocation possible for direct instructional purposes. The school first rating is based upon an analysis of staff and student data reported for the 17-18 school year and budgetary and actual financial data for fiscal year August 31st, 2018. The school first rating rated the district based upon scores received from 15 separate performance indicators. Each indicator was designed to assess the quality of the financial management of the district's resources. Indicators one through five are pass fail. Indicators six through 15 are worth 10 points each. The school first accountability rating system assigns four possible ratings to Texas districts and they are outlined here. We are pleased to report this evening that Conroe ISD has been awarded a perfect score, receiving 100 out of 100 possible points, resulting in a rating of A or superior. The superior rating is the state's highest, demonstrating the quality of Conroe ISD's financial management and reporting system. Now we will go through each of the 15 indicators individually. Indicator one, was the complete annual financial report AFER and data submitted to TEA within the 30 days of the January 28th deadline for the district's fiscal year end, August 31st. Conroe ISD's data was submitted on January 22nd, 2019. We passed this indicator. Indicator 2A, was there an unmodified opinion in the AFR on the financial statements as a whole? Yes, Conroe ISD received an unmodified opinion, which is the highest assurance that they can receive from an external auditor. 2B, did the external independent auditor report that the AFR was free of any instances of material weakness in internal controls over financial reporting, reporting and compliance for local, state, or federal funds? Yes, Conroe ISD received a clean audit. Indicator 3, was the school district in compliance with payment terms for all debt obligations at fiscal year end? Yes, we were in compliance with all payment terms. Number four, did the school district make timely payments to the teacher retirement system, the Texas Workforce Commission, the Internal Revenue Service, and other governmental agencies? Yes, all payments were made on time. Indicator five, was the total unrestricted net position balance in the governmental activities <coughs> column in the statement of net assets greater than zero? This indicator was not scored for any pub Texas public schools this year as a result of GASB 75 which required districts to report their proportionate share of the state's liability with regard to other post-employment benefits. All districts would have been negative, therefore they did not score this indicator. Number six, was the number of days cash on hand and current investments in the general fund for the district sufficient to cover operating expenditures? The threshold to receive a perfect score was 90 days cash on hand. Conroe ISD had 113 days cash on hand. Number seven, was the measure of current assets to current liabilities ratio for the district sufficient to cover short-term debt? Yes, Conroe ISD's ratio was 3.14. We needed a 3.0 to score a 10. Was the ratio of long-term liabilities to total assets for the district sufficient to cover long-term solvency? If the district's membership over the last five years was greater than 7% or more growth, the district automatically passes this indicator. Conroe ISD's membership increased by 8.14%. We received a 10 on this indicator. Indicator nine, did the district's general fund revenues equal or exceed expenditures? Yes. Indicator 10, was the debt service coverage ratio sufficient to meet the required debt service? Yes, Conroe ISD's ratio 1.37. We needed a 1.2 to get a perfect score. Indicator 11, was the school district's administrative cost ratio equal to or less than the threshold ratio? TEO, TEA and state law set a cap on the percentage of budget that Texas districts can spend on administration. The threshold to receive a perfect score on this indicator was 0 0.0855. Conroe ISD's ratio was less than half that at 0 0.0397. We received a 10 on this indicator. Indicator 12, 
Did the school district not have a 15% decline in the student to staff ratio? If student enrollment did not decrease, we automatically pass this indicator. Conroe ISD's enrollment increased by 3,341 students over the three year period, 2015 16 to 17 18. We received a 10 on this indicator. Indicator 13 Did the comparison of PEMS data to like information in the AFRA result in an aggregate variance of less than 3% of all expenditures by function? Conroe ISD had zero variances. Indicator 14. Did the external independent auditor indicate that the AFRA was free of any instance of material noncompliance for grants, contracts, and laws related to local, state, or federal funds? Conroe ISD received a clean audit. And lastly, indicator 15. Did the school district not receive an adjusted repayment schedule for more than one fiscal year for an overallocation of foundation school program funds as a result of financial hardship? The district is in good financial standing. And as always, we like to compare with our peer districts. This slide shows how Conroe ISD's first rating compares with our surrounding peer districts. The first report, along with the additional required disclosures that includes the superintendent's contract and the school first annual financial management report can be located on the district's transparency website at the link listed below. Thank you, Mrs. Stars. At this time, we will open it up to public comment. If you have a comment on the district's first presentation, if you please come to the podium and state your name. All right, seeing no takers, that will conclude our public hearing. Mr. President, back to you. Board meeting back in session. Time is 7.15. All right, item, um, where are we at? Five, six, seven, business finance. I think we're yes, sir. You're correct. You're correct. Business finance consider award RF, RFP number 1908 01, um, instructional supplies and material for the classroom. Mr. Rice, please. <coughs> yes, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Tonight, we're recommending the Board of Trustees award RFP 19 01 A instructional supplies and materials for the classroom to the vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated annual expenditure of $7.5 million. Requests for proposals pertaining, pertaining to instructional supplies and materials for the classroom were emailed to registered vendors through the e electronic e-bidding system. This request allows vendors who may or, not, may or may not be affiliated with a purchasing cooperative the opportunity to legally do business with Conroe ISD if the district so chooses. Vendors were asked to offer a percentage discount off shelf or catalog prices. The proposal was advertised multiple times in the courier. 170 vendors sub submitted a response. Of those responses, approximately 41% of the awarded vendors were not previously awarded by the district or a purchasing cooperative. Contracts with the awarded vendors will remain firm through July 31st, 2020, automatically renewing for four additional one-year terms through July 31st, 2024. Proposals were evaluated by the CISD Purchasing Department. Recommendations for award are noted on the attached list. At this time, I recommend your approval. Gentlemen, can I entertain a motion? I move approval as presented. I have Thank a you. motion, I have a second. Discussion? Here or not, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, <coughs> item um, 7B, business finance report. Yes, Mr. Rice. All right, here to present the financial statements for the month of September. Uh, these statements will include our general fund, debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. Our balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances for the district. And each month, we always like to look at our cash and investments. And once again, we'll concentrate on our general fund. Uh, we have cash on hand of $14,100. We have bank deposits of $315,000. We have investments in our state pools of a little over $70 million. We have investments with Wood Forest National Bank at $75.5 million. And our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors of $51.5 million for total cash and investments in the general fund of $197.3 million. 
The next statement we'll look at is our income statement for the month of September. Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures and fund balances. Revenues are broken down into three categories that include local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, and federal program revenues. If you look at the uh, general fund, you can see we received our state, state payment on September 25th, uh, about $45 million that month. And we can also look at the year-to-date expenditures by major category for each of the funds. First month uh, of the new plan year for our self-funded insurance with uh, United Healthcare. As you can see, we had total revenues of a little over $4 million. We had total expenses of $3.4 million uh, for revenues over expenses for the first month of $578,000. I would like to point out the majority of the expenses were still carryover expenditures uh, from our previous plan. And so we'll, we'll start seeing some of the uh, United Healthcare claims uh, in the next few months. Participation in our wellness centers uh, remained strong, 548 in the month of September, so we're very proud of that. Investments for the month, uh, par value of our total portfolio, $320 million. Our pools are yielding 2.27%. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank, 2.15%. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors have a WAM of 438 days, and they're yielding 2.105%, leaving us with a combined portfolio of a WAM of 66 days, yielding 2.163. And our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is at 1.79%. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Rice. Yes, sir. Just real quick. On our, on our budget, not on the finances, but on our budget, is our is our budget posted online yet? Yes, sir. No, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. And that's the budget we approved in um, August. August, right? Yeah, it was posted that night. Posted yes, that night. That's what I thought. We also have our, our actual full budget book out there now with all the detail and all the all the literature that's out there on our transparency website also. Awesome. Thank you. Just Rice, one yes, other question. Uh, we heard a while ago that to get that 10 points on that question, uh, I think we needed 90 days. Yes, sir. Liquidity. Mm -hmm. And we have 113. 113. Yes, sir. Okay. But I mean, it, it takes into account our investments with Wood Forest, our overnight investments. Oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, Is that I'm, where you? I'm, I think that's wonderful. I just. Okay. What I'm saying is, you know, I guess when you're doing your personal budget, and, you know, and I, I need 25000 in the bank and we need $50 million in the bank, it's sometimes hard to see these numbers. It's like, you know, wasteful. But, I mean, that's good practice. It, that's what the state is telling you, right? Correct. I hear a lot of, of, of nonsense about, of course, it's on the M&O side, first of all. But second of all, that, that you know, we're just... And all this money is just, you know, don't know, don't know, even know what to do with it. We don't, we can't even spend it all or something. I don't know what, exactly what they're thinking. So anyway, ninety days is just what it takes to be right, and that and that's about twenty five percent of our budget. I'm, I, I got it. I mean, that's like a financial. We lower twenty you percent know, by the way. That's financial management one hundred and one. Yes, we have twenty five percent. So yes. anyway, I I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding that. You know, that is correct. There's been a lot of misunderstanding here lately. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Appreciate Thank you. you. And, and team. Um, so item eight, executive session. We'll, we'll up in executive session. All right, item 10, legal. Uh, Board of Trustees, continuing education announcement. All right, that's me. Under um, State Board of Education rule. <laughs> Under State Board of Education rule, completing required continuing education. Uh, each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. As president of Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees, in accordance with local board policy BBD, I'm required to annually announce at the last regular board meeting before the board's uniform election day the status of each board member's continuing education credit. Board members are required to receive continuing education training in four areas called tiers. Those areas are in orientation, and legal update, team building, team building, uh, general continuing education in areas such as accountability, advocacy, structure, and vision, and evaluating student academic performance. I am pleased to announce that all members of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees have exceeded the required amount of continuing education training specifically. Mr. Sanders has exceeded the required amount of continuing education by 8.25 hours. Mr. Hubert 
has exceeded the uh, required amount of continuing education training hours by 8.25 hours. Uh, Mr. Kidd has exceeded the required amount of continuing education hours by 8.25 hours. Mr. Husband has exceeded the required amount of continuing education training by 8.25 hours. Mr. Moore has exceeded the required amount of education hours by 9.25. Show off. He's the valedictorian. <laughs> And Mr. Emman has exceeded the required amount of continuing education training hours by one hour. And I have exceeded the required amount of continuing education training by 8.25 hours. This announcement will be reflected in the minutes of this meeting. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'll entertain a motion to dismiss. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>